I have uh, preached today's sermon, the crack cup, 21 other times. Not here. <laughs> I've preached it 21 other times at different churches and occasions since I first preached it in Montreal over 30 years ago in 1987. 1987, the first time I preached this sermon. It is my most often requested sermon if I go somewhere. I even preached it at a funeral because a young wife and mother of two little boys who died of breast cancer made me promise before she died that I would do two things. Number one, no matter where I was in the world, I would go back to Canada and I would conduct her funeral because she knew she was going to die. And number two, I would preach this sermon at that occasion. Well, I got the call one night in 2010 that she had passed. And so Lise and I left our home in Oklahoma and we drove 1,200 miles to Waterloo, Ontario, Canada to officiate at her funeral service and to preach the sermon entitled The Crack Cup. Today, May 13th, 2018, Mother's Day, I repeat this lesson and I dedicate it to all the moms who are here and all the moms like Maureen who have passed on. One of my favorite stories about our family involves a cup. The cup in question was a porcelain cup with Snow White hand painted on it. And it was purchased as a souvenir from Disneyland when my wife Lise was just a little girl. Now the problem with this cup was that over the years it became cracked. And it became cracked right at the handle, you know where you put your fingers in there and you hold the cup right at the top there, right at that top spot. It, it developed like a small crack. You could hardly see it, but you would know it was there because when you put it down, it would go thunk. You know, it just didn't sound right. It had a little fragile sound. Now this might not be a problem for you and your household, but you see the Mazalongos were the world champion glass and dish breakers. <laughs> My wife and I had four children in the space of five years. Someone said, we should have our kids close together so they'll all be friends. And if I ever find that guy, <laughs> telling you. So Lise and I and these four wild children broke a lot of dishes, glasses, windows. Paul said one day with his BB rifle, shooting into a eight foot by eight foot uh, glass uh, window. He said, watch this bounce. $400 later. <laughs> but all through this glass breaking, this little cup survived. Despite its crack and our poor track record with dishes. Because everybody knew that it was mom's special cup. It was a precious souvenir from her childhood. One bump and it was finished. So we handled it with care. And this was the days before crazy glue. No crazy glue in those days. You see, we were all conscious of its fragility. And so whenever we used it, it was with this silent understanding. When washing it, we would always be careful to turn the damaged handle you know, inward in the dishwasher to protect its weak spot. And so the result of all of this was that we ended up using this little cup more than any other dish in the entire house. The dishes, they came, they went. A new set of glasses came and went. A new set of cups and saucers came and went. But this little cup, it just kept hanging on and hanging on. And it became precious to us in its flawed state because 
It was the only piece of dishware that required love in order to be handled. I could use my big tumbler for ice and just whack it around. But that little cup, you had to be careful how you handled it. Hard to believe, but that little cup made us all become better people somehow. I think that there's a parallel here between our family's attitude toward that little porcelain cup and the attitude that we should have towards each other in the church, you and me and you and each other. I believe that the church is like a cupboard where the Lord keeps all kinds of cracked and broken dishes. And he's able to use these for a service because he's careful. He uses them, but he never forgets their weaknesses. The result is that he uses fragile things to do great service because he uses us with love. In speaking of the Lord's tenderness in the use of delicate things, Isaiah the prophet says the following, a bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. Isaiah 42, verse three. And I might add to that passage, and a cracked cup he will not break. Now I don't know everybody's story here, I know a lot of them, but I'm willing to guess that if we are like most congregations, there are a lot of damaged cups in this place even some cracked pots in this place. And I can assure you that the guy in the pulpit has his share of chips and bruises. Now, the weakness and the damage may not all be in the same spot for each of us, but everybody has a tender spot. And if you hit too hard on that spot, they'll fall apart into a million pieces, just like that broken cup. I don't think we're always conscious of this fact, and that's why there is at times a lot of broken glass lying around the church. I sincerely believe that no one even deliberately wants to hurt anyone, and certainly no one wants anyone to stomp on their own sore spot. But it happens, not only in the church, but it happens at work, and it happens in families, and it happens between friends. For this reason, the Apostle Paul, in this passage just read, gives us three very simple rules for handling crack cups and handling them in such a way that we do not inflict further damage upon them. These rules, hopefully, will help us avoid damaging others who are sensitive and already suffering from broken and weak parts. So this is the part of the sermon that I call how to handle a cracked cup according, according to Paul. Now the passage, a little bit of background on the passage here. These rules are found in chapter four and five of Ephesians. This passage here that was read is set in the middle of a very long section dealing with the problem of getting along with others in the church. Apparently the Ephesian Christians had been very zealous for the word of God. They had been very zealous to obey it and to teach it properly. And they wanted to do the right thing. But in their enthusiasm about guarding against false doctrine and teachers, they were becoming suspicious and mean-spirited with one another. In this context, Paul writes to them, giving them instructions about how to do better and how to better love each other and avoid hurting those who are already damaged. And he gives three rules in handling the crack cups of this world in our families and in the church. First rule, well, I'll read it first, just a section I'm looking at. I'll repeat, he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So there's the passage, here's number one. Be kind, he says, be kind. The word in the Greek means literally to do good. This includes saying good and thinking good and doing good for other people. 
Spiritual maturity is measured by kindness, not just church attendance or orthodoxy or busyness. Kindness is a quality of character that is so like Christ. It's easy to spot kind people. Kind people are sensitive, not just smart. They're givers, not accumulators. They strive to be appealing rather than just attractive. And kindness strengthens other people. That it's, that's its most powerful trait. The best way to make the church grow is through kindness. Why? Because people respond to kindness. They'll work for kindness. They'll sacrifice for one who is kind to them. Next to the gospel itself, kindness is the most effective evangelistic tool. Paul's unspoken point is that if we cannot expect Christians to be kind to each other, who can we expect to be kind? And so if we wish to avoid damaging other people, we must consciously practice kindness towards each other, openly, generously, without prejudice. Second rule to handle cracked cups, be tenderhearted. Be tenderhearted. To be tenderhearted doesn't mean that a person is soft or wimpy. Tenderheartedness is that quality of character where one is so moved by the other's condition that he not only feels sympathy, but he'll take some kind of action. Today, we use another word. We use the word empathy. Empathy, that's tenderheartedness. Tenderheartedness is present when we feel sorry for the hurt in the other person, not feel superior because we don't have a crack in that spot in our own character. Well, look at that guy. Well, I never, I've ever seen that guy. You know? It's always easiest to spot the fault that somebody else has that we don't have. Tenderheartedness wants to help heal the damaged spot in the other person, rather than criticize and condemn the other because of their weakness. Tenderheartedness says that we're willing to handle with love the delicate condition of our brethren, not just discard them because of their defects. You ever hear that term? People say this sometimes, ah, you can't help those people. That guy's so messed up, nothing to do for him. She's so far gone, you know I mean? It's, why even try? Is that the attitude, really? Is that the attitude that emanated from the cross? Just ask yourself that. When we're thinking on how to respond, when we're thinking of how are we going to deal with so-and-so, when we're thinking, you know, what should my attitude be towards that person, you know, should we not ask ourselves what attitude was emanating from the cross? Is that our attitude at the moment? You know, there ought to be a sign out front that says, damaged people are welcome here. The reason some people have difficulty being tenderhearted is because their own damage or weak spot is in their own eyes. They're blind, they can't see themselves, they cannot see their own damage. But even for these people, we have to be tenderhearted. Jesus was most kind to the most blind Pharisee of all, Saul of Tarsus. It was no coincidence that he was blinded when he saw Jesus and then regained his sight when he recognized how blind he had been. And then the third rule, to deal with damaged people. Forgive each other. Forgive each other. Now there's forgiveness at two levels, you need to understand. First level of forgiveness. Forgiveness at direct offenses against us. I mean, things happen, right? People say things, people do things, nasty things. We're on the receiving end of hurt. Now some people say, well, forgive and forget. And some say, well, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget. Well, I'll tell you something. Forgiving is not about forgetting. Some things done to us, we will never forget. In 1963, 
Teddy Rogers, a so-called friend of mine, wrote me a check for $60 and it bounced. 63, 73, 83, 93, 2003, 2013. Is that 60 years plus? Teddy Roderick gave me a bum check for 60 bucks in 63. Looks like I didn't forget. <laughs> Why? Because forgiveness is not about forgetting. Forgiveness is about letting go. I've forgiven Teddy. He doesn't owe me that 60 bucks anymore. Especially since I've used his story 22 times, but that's a whole other <laughs> thing. <laughs> forgiving an offense, a real offense, or forgiving a debt is considering that debt paid, not forgetting that it was once owed. And I mean this sincerely. If Teddy Roderick came up to me smiling today, you know, with uh, $600, you know, to pay the interest back, <laughs> I would refuse it because I have forgiven him that debt. People offend us, they bump into our weak areas and we deserve to receive an apology. We have a right to be uh, compensated, but forgiveness is that action where you cancel the debt that somebody owes you. You don't owe me anymore. You do this, you control this, you offer this as the solution to the problem whether they can pay or not. That puts you back into control and it gives God the glory. So there's forgiveness at a direct offense, but then there is forgiveness also as a spirit of tolerance and patience. You see, we must also forgive the weaknesses we see in others that don't directly offend us or affect us, but they get on our nerves. You haven't hurt my feelings, you bug me. <laughs> that kind of forgiveness. They don't steal from us or insult us, but the way they are offends our sense of how we think they ought to be. They don't live up to our scorecard or the Bible's scorecard, uh, but our opinion of how people should be. That's what bugs us about them. You don't act or look like I think you ought to look like, therefore you bug me. But spiritual damage control requires us to forgive others who crash into our weak spots, to exercise patience with those we believe have no right to be in the cupboard in the first place because they're way too damaged, they're way too cracked to be of any use to us. We need to remember that God has handled us so tenderly, so carefully that we are still in one piece and the greatest miracle of all is that he continues to use us despite our delicate condition. God has overlooked all of our imperfections and all of our damage and all of our cracks as we are placed into Christ Jesus. And so we need to extend that same kind of mercy towards others when someone offends you or bugs you. Ask yourself, is this where I'm going to cut off the grace of God to another person? No more grace for you, boy. I'm turning that grace tap off. No more for you. Remember, when you turn off the flow of grace for another, you turn it off for yourself as well. Because it only flows down. The person who bugs you, the person who's offended you, you turn off the grace for that person. As you're doing that, the Lord is upstairs turning off the tap for you, buddy. Because it only flows on us if we allow it to flow on somebody else. That's spiritual, that's a spiritual law that is as sure as gravity. And so Paul concludes with the key idea in chapter five, one and two, the love of the saints for one another is like a, a fragrant aroma, he says, a perfume to God, 
as was the sacrifice of Christ. The love of God in Christ, he says, this is the glue that repairs the cracks and provides a renewed life of service. I liked what Titus said. Now we're having to say, even Titus and I, who did the communion, we didn't talk about what he was going to be talking about, but what did he talk about? He talked about us, that the communion time is a time for us to be thinking about our unity together. And what is the final up draft of my lesson. Paul is saying this kindness, this forgiveness, this love, this is the glue that unites us together. This is the way God puts us back together after we're all beaten and broken. He does it with his love. And we in the church, we are the channels for this love and we are the agents that he uses in repairing all the broken lives that come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. Without this kind of love, we cannot grow in a way that is pleasing to God. It doesn't matter that we're a lot of people, really it doesn't matter that we're a lot of people. We can knock these walls down and there could be 10,000 people here and it doesn't matter. Because when the Lord comes, he's not going to be looking for a lot of people. He's going to be looking for a faithful people. And a faithful people will be a people that are living with one another in love. That's who he's looking for. Whether we're 50 united here or 50,000, it's the same thing that he will be uh, looking for. So if you're a crack cup, if that's you, unused, unloved, unnoticed, unclean, I encourage you to offer your broken dishes to God today by coming to Jesus in repentance of your lack of love for yourself and lack of love for others, your lack of love for God by disobeying his word. And baptism, the cleansing, the washing away of the sin, the new life in Christ Jesus. I beg you, I beg you, let him love you. Let him repair your damage with his love. Let him cover your weakness with the blood of his cross. For the rest of the cups in the cupboard, I read a poem by a brother, uh, Louis Stevenson, who summarized well the thoughts in this lesson. And he wrote this way back in the 80s. He heard this sermon and he came, he wrote to me the next day and he said, I just had an inspiration. So I want to read that little poem to you. Leonard, excuse me, not Lewis, Leonard Stevenson. He says, please handle with care for I have a crack and that isn't all in which I lack. My handle is weak, so please take care. Yes, sometimes life is so hard to bear and appears to me as I look about, everyone has cracks, not all are stout. And if not cracked, then broken or bent or scratched, bruised, torn and rent. And since this is true, let's all be kind tender-hearted, forgiving, gentle, not blind, to the cracks, flaws, and bruises each have got, and heed the lessons our Savior taught. Let's bind up the cracks of one another, and especially those of our sister and brother. So exercise tolerance and patience too, but especially love, for this is the glue. And here is Maureen. If you need to respond to our invitation this morning, then I encourage you to come forward now as John leads us in our song of encouragement. Shall we stand? <laughs>